This week on The Record, abortion on the ballot. We go behind the scenes into the push to find middle ground in Missouri. Pro-choice Republican Jamie Corley is on the record with her plan to put that abortion question to voters. City of Shadows, why transparency is stifled and inmates have died at the St. Louis City Justice Center. Alderman Rasheen Aldridge is on the record with his plan to help the jail watchdogs lawyer up. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. A protracted court battle over the phrasing of a Missouri abortion ballot question is over. Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft lost his legal appeal to try and inject what the courts called inaccurate and partisan language into that ballot question. But while Republican state officials were holding that ballot effort up in court, another Republican operative was coming up with a different ballot question. It's a middle ground compromise, if you will. Instead of allowing abortion up until fetal viability at 24 weeks with no questions asked, this proposal would allow abortion up until 12 weeks or in cases of rape or incest if the victim calls a sexual assault hotline first. Jamie Corley is heading up the Missouri Women and Family Research Fund. She's now on the record. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I want to get into all the differences between this proposal and the rival proposal out there. Planned Parenthood says that requiring a rape victim to call a sexual assault victim hotline is a, quote, harmful hoop for that victim to jump through. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that question? Yeah, so currently we have an abortion ban that has no exceptions for rape and incest. And so what we're doing is we want to make sure that victims do have access to abortion, um, which they, again, currently don't have. So we've put forth forth a proposal that would allow a crime victim to get an abortion um, before fetal viability um, in the cases of rape or incest. The, the question doesn't specify who runs the hotline. Does right. the state run it? That's a great question. So, um, you know, there's a lot of criticisms about a rep reporting requirement, and we were very aware of these when we wrote the ballot initiative. What we're doing in Missouri is a very novel approach. Um, in other states where victims have to re report to the police, we know that that actually cancels care. So we wanted to create a reporting requirement that was not so... Um, onerous that it would prevent victims from um, actually seeking the care that they want and deserve. Mm -hmm. When victims call this hotline, it can be done anonymously and confidentially. The hotline does not have to be in Missouri. It can be a national hotline. It can be um, web-based, text-based. So the requirement would fall into the doctor to confirm that the hotline had been called? Absolutely okay. not. The doctor, no. no. The doctor is not the gatekeeper of this requirement. Who is? The person would have to say, you know, I, um, they I call the hotline. Yes, they okay. self-report. On the politics of all this, uh, when NBC reporter Dasha Burns asked you why not support something more expansive, you said, quote, we need something that can pass. Well, if seven other states have all had abortion on the ballot and all seven states have approved or overturned their abortion bans, why wouldn't Missouri? Michigan, for example, um, they approved abortion up until viability. They codified Roe. Michigan is an extremely democratic state. It's almost inverse of, of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Ohio is a very red state, and they um, voted just a couple weeks ago to expand abortion access. That is extremely exciting for people who want to see um, some sort of abortion access returned. Other groups are not, are going way beyond what they did in Ohio and Michigan. So it's not um, an apples to apples comparison. Sure, so, the details matter. Yeah, well, other groups want to actually put in Missouri what they have in Vermont. Vermont is the only state in the country that has constitutional protections for abortion for any reason at any time in pregnancy. You're talking about the more uh, expansive abortion question, which we still don't know yet which question they might land on. But we do know that major players in that coalition have gone very on the record to say they do not support codifying Roe. It never went far enough mm -hmm. and they will not support viability limits. So really that leaves one option on the table and it's the Vermont plan, which is never going to pass in Missouri. The Vermont plan, I wonder if we're gonna hear that coinage, uh, that that yeah, phrase being maybe. used again. Uh, okay, so <laughs> as we look at this, and it, it sounds like there's a division right now between the pro-choice advocates. You said you're pro-choice. Obviously, the Planned mm -hmm. Parenthood folks are pro-choice. So say at the end of all this, it's election day, and 48% of Missouri voters back your plan. Maybe 44% 
back that 24 week or uh, all, all, no limits plan basically and then 35 to you know 40 percent vote no mm -hmm. uh, around the rest of the state who wins that would be so unfortunate, wouldn't it? And that's the risk you take here. Well, it's the, not the risk that we take. We have put forth a plan that is passable in Missouri. So, you know, if other coalitions want to put forth a plan that has absolutely zero pathway to victory, again, the Vermont plan is never going to pass in Missouri. If they want to go forward, you know, that would be really disappointing, but that's, that's a call they have to make. But I have to say that we actually think it's a um, positive that we are getting pushback from both sides. We have a really unique dynamic here at play in Missouri where we have one of the most conservative anti-abortion groups. Again, they advocated for a plan with a, no exceptions. That's to the right of Donald Trump, of Josh Hawley. You know, they're all on the record saying they support these exceptions. So this is a really fringe plan. But then on the other side, we have a coalition of Planned Parenthood that is way beyond what is mainstream pro-life policies. So way beyond what they did in Ohio and mm -hmm. Michigan. And so if both of those groups don't like what we're doing, that's actually proof positive that we are right where we need to be. And we have the majority of voters in line with us. Well, I think at some point to unite those coalitions to get the, the those pro-choice voters to actually punch yes on your ballot question, that's the ultimate tough test is uniting here. Well, you know, I, I'm going to push back on this because a lot of pro-choice voters feel very alienated by comments made last night by the medical director of Planned Parenthood, you know, or earlier this week. She was asked very directly, is 12 weeks, so that's our plan, mm -hmm. isn't that better than nothing? And she said no. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense to the average voter in Missouri. Why, why leave these women out to dry? And, and we've invited the Planned Parenthood and Dr. Colleen McNicholas to this program, and we hope to have them in the near future. Uh, but you're talking about some national exposure that your yeah. plan is already getting on NBC Nightly News. Uh, that story quoted a conservative Catholic woman, Allie Rand, who recently changed her views on the topic when she herself became pregnant. Here's what she told Dasha Burns. It was terrifying. It felt very um, like I have... I had no options here. If something were to go wrong, what was I going to do? What did that yeah. feel like to know that in the yeah. state where you live, live? And love, I love living in Missouri. That yeah. you had no choices. It's just a really helpless feeling. Almost makes you feel like if you chose to leave the state, that you're a criminal. Allie says she never thought she'd support abortion until it became personal to her. Mm -hmm. Your ballot question would ban the use of taxpayer funds for abortion services. That includes Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Hyde Amendment already exists at the national level. The Hyde Amendment already says taxpayer money can't go to abortion. Federal taxpayer funds. Right. But let me use an example. Across state lines, mm -hmm. uh, six years ago, Another pro-choice Republican, like yourself, former Governor Bruce Rauner, signed HB 40. It did two things. One, it removed the trigger provision that would say abortion would become illegal in Illinois should Roe one day be overturned. Mm -hmm. We know now that it was. It also said we're not going to ban Medicaid dollars from providing the same suite of services to women in poverty, women on, on Medicaid. The argument at the time was that those women in poverty shouldn't be considered second-rate citizens by the state, that they should be allowed the same access to those services. So. If Missouri can go so far mm -hmm. as to alter its constitution to accommodate a rich Catholic conservative woman, why would it deny the same services to a poor pregnant woman? Missouri voters don't want taxpayers to go toward funding abortion. And I think that that's reflective in our ballot amendment. But that's the kind of real world scenario uh, we're going to see play out if women on Medicaid, if their health insurance policy denies them abortion care. I just don't see Missouri voters wanting, you know, their taxpayers to go toward abortion. We're a conservative state and what is policy at the federal level? Interesting discussion. We have a lot of ways to go before this all gets on the ballot. Uh, and we mm -hmm. look forward to continuing that conversation with you, Jamie Crowley. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. In one month, we will take a look back on the top 10 political stories of 2023. And we want to hear from you. Do you have any idea which of those stories should make the list? Let us know. Text record to 314-425-5355 to find out how you can help us share those ideas. Under pressure, what's next for the director of the city jail? Why watchdogs want her fired? A good burger, two meal at Arby's? Is this a dream?
No, it isn't. Isn't that right, talking strawberry shake? Yep. Right, talking hat sign? Totally real. Arby's, we have the meat. Your neighbor for life, Neighbors Credit Union. Hi, kids. So it turns out this new T-Mobile home internet we got slows down when we're all online. There's not enough speed for all of us. So the only solution is one of us has to move out. It can't be mom because... My salary. Your mom's very successful. Jake? I'm the only one that laughs at your jokes. Thanks, pal. Lisa? I get straight A's. Yeah, but it's fourth grade. Can't be Sally because... I'm six years old. So it's me. Bye, Daddy. T-Mobile home internet slows down when you need it most. Get faster, more reliable internet speeds for everyone with Spectrum. However you do the holidays, do it together in the Chevy that's right for you. The strong and capable Chevy Silverado, the award-winning Chevy Equinox, or the all-new Chevy Trax. This holiday season, do more together in a new Chevy. Get 1.9% financing on all 2023 Equinox models. Plus, make no monthly payments for 90 days. Or use your red tag bonus cash to get $12.50 total cash allowance. Chevrolet. Together, let's drive. Ready or not, here I come. I have a big family because I'm adopted. My bio mom, Katie, was scared when she first learned about me. So she chose my mom and dad to be my parents. That's my mom. We don't have the same eyes or hair, but we have the same heart. And that's my dad. Different smiles, same silliness. Learn more about confidential pregnancy options counseling and adoption services at caritasfamilysolutions.org. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Too much turkey? Overslept? Shopping for that air fryer? There's still time to save hundreds, thousands. Yes, the incredible Kettle River Furniture and Bedding Black Friday sale continues. The same top name furniture, the same top name mattresses. Everything in the showroom is still at once a year special sale prices. Famous brands, great service, once a year reductions, all here waiting for you. The Kettle River River Furniture and Bedding Black Friday Sale in Edwardsville. Delivery before the holidays? Yes. The director of the St. Louis City Justice Center is rejecting calls for her to resign her post as Mayor Tashara Jones shrugs off calls to fire her. Jennifer Clemens Abdullah says she needs more time to fix long-standing issues of safety in the city jail. But patience is wearing thin from progressive activists who pledge to protect detainees. Alderman Rasheen Aldridge is now on the record alongside our own Christine Byers, whose reporting shined a light on the conditions inside that jail. Rasheen, Reverend Daryl Gray uh, just said that this mayor and this jail director care more about protecting the city from lawsuits than they care about the constitutional rights of those detainees who, by the way, remain innocent until proven guilty. Do you agree with him? You know, I disagree with the Reverend. I do believe that our mayor actually cares about transparency. Um, however, I think being in a position of uh, the administration, uh, a lot of time it's about trying to protect the city and uh, it's not about bringing transparent information that's important, uh, not just to the board members, but to the city of St. Louis. So I don't think that uh, the mayor doesn't care about oversight. However, uh, I do believe though Sheena, who's a city councilor, cares more about protecting the city than actually um, talking about the hard issues that are happening right now at the jail. That's Sheena Hamilton. So the mayor and the city councilor and the top lawyer have uh, juggling priorities, to say the least. Uh, Christine, you've reported some, uh, some specifics out of the jail, like a death toll, like autopsy results, even obtained some leaked video from confidential sources who have gone on the record with you to talk about what's going on there. Given your familiarity with all this, how would you describe the state of transparency right now at the city jail? Well, first and foremost, I would give credit to the jail commissioner for going ahead with an interview with us. That said, though, she really didn't answer any of the questions I had for her. She was she didn't have specifics on overdoses, which I think is a critical issue in the jail right now. And she also wasn't sure about some of the policies and procedures I'd asked her about when I asked why haven't any why haven't any policies or procedures been updated. So those were some of the issues that we kind of talked about with her that she really didn't have good answers for. And I noticed that when you asked her about the head count, how many staff does she have? She's hid behind, well, I might compromise safety and security, but 
that didn't stop her from giving you the headcount when she took the job. Exactly. So she did go on to say that when I first took the job about two years ago, we were 30 to 50 officers short. And then when I asked her, okay, how are we now? She said she wasn't going to tell me for safety and security reasons, but she did admit that it's even worse. There and are more vacancies. Alderman Aldridge, watchdogs at the Detention Facilities Oversight Board, that's their job to actually investigate complaints at the jail. They've been turned away so far. Now, they say they've completed their training to actually get inside. They hope to return there soon to see something. But if they faced this much opposition, just getting their foot in the door, then why would anyone believe the jail would openly accept their recommendations for change? I would say right now the Board of Aldermen is watching. Uh, we've been taking this situation very serious uh, since the former commissioner, Matt Brumman, had resigned. Uh, that's why, you know, we started working on legislation to actually make uh, the prior legislation that Alderwoman Shameen Clark uh, Hubbard passed a lot stronger to actually put teeth in there to make sure that they have internal and external counsel, to make sure that the amount of training uh, that they need to get in the jails is actually clear. Because the old legislation, was, it was very vague, and the goalposts kept moving. But this board is watching because uh, we care about oversight. We care about the seven deaths that have recently happened under the current commissioner mm -hmm. and the last uh, total of 10 under this mayor. Christine, he mentioned teeth in these recommendations. So far, we've seen them as just recommendations. Like, for example, from Congresswoman Cori Bush, who wrote a number of uh, ideas and tried to start a conversation, but is there any evidence that those changes are taking place? Not that I've seen so far. I mean, Cori Bush sent a letter to Commissioner Jennifer Clemens Abdullah demanding a bunch of answers and, and policies and that sort of thing. She put a deadline on that demand letter for November 2nd. Jennifer Clemens Abdullah responded November 3rd, pointed the Congresswoman to several policies online, just gave hyperlinks to existing policies. And again, the investigation we did showed that Jennifer Clemens Abdullah has not updated or even written a single policy or procedure during her entire two years at the head of this jail. So all of those things that she pointed the Congresswoman to have been in existence for a long time. It seems to be a contradicting position to say, give me more time to improve things, but also we haven't updated those policies in two years. Alderman, Reverend Gray also said the city seems to be, in his view, more concerned with liability, uh, civil liability. So I'm not going to ask you to speculate about the potential damages or the cost of some lawsuit that hasn't even been uh, argued yet. As you read the room and you see just the level of concern at City Hall about those details, what does that tell you? What does that indicate? about the nature of those kinds of complaints? What might be learned in a, in a courtroom if, the, if those details ever come to light? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think uh, the city councilor is more concerned about trying to protect the city, which is to some level is understandable. But at the same time, uh, we have to really look at what are the situations that are going on in the jail. And I think this board of aldermen also agrees that it's bigger than just lawsuits. We're losing life. Yes, jail is not a place of luxury, but uh, there's been, like I said, 10 people killed in the jail. That's why this uh, board of aldermen passed that uh, board bill overwhelmingly. There was not one person who didn't support it. Even Sharon Tyus, who haven't supported in the past, only voted present. But we're trying to hopefully move to a place even outside of this is how do we get real um, independent oversight for this, uh, mm -hmm. this oversight board. And there was a class action lawsuit. Uh, the alderman's telling us the board is applying pressure. Lawsuits can certainly alter behavior, Christine. You've talked to a number of experts who work in this space in your reporting. What do they tell you about the ways the city can do both of these things, both improve conditions for detainees and lower their own liability? It all comes down to staff really at the end of the day because when you have a reduced number of staff your sort of risk if you will of maybe behavior by staff themselves who are afraid who are outnumbered they may be more aggressive with inmates as well as a result of that and I also feel like we've also seen a, a staff member actually taken hostage during a situation by two inmates when they were alone passing out breakfast tray. There's no reason, and, and whistleblowers have told me behind the scenes, that there should never have been one single guard by himself doing that task with two prisoners like that. Alderman, we'll give you the final word before we go quickly. Are you satisfied with the level of urgency from either the city's jail director or the mayor on this issue? The city jail director, no. I've uh, called that she needs to resign. I think there's been too many uh, issues that have happened under her watch. Even now that your bill is passing? Even now that the bill is passed, uh, we look forward to seeing how that now this board has has teeth that they actually can do what is necessary. And from the mayor, I do give her credit. She, she worked with uh, myself to make sure that this piece of legislation worked for her office, but more importantly, I pushed to make sure that it worked for the members of the DFOB. Thank you for joining us. We'll call this segment the Rasheen and Christine Show. Has a certain <laughs> ring to it. Thank you both. We'll be back. <laughs> Thank you.
It's deja vu all over again. Could Missouri courts strike down the voter ID law a third time? That story after the break. A good burger two meal at Arby's? Is this a dream? No, it isn't. Isn't that right, talking strawberry shake? Yep. Right, talking hat sign? Totally real. Arby's, we have the meat. Whether you celebrate mistletoe magic in a Cadillac XT5, festive gatherings in a Cadillac XT4, or reinventing traditions in a Cadillac XT6, this holiday season, Cadillac is celebrating you. Get 2.9% APR for 36 months plus 1,000 purchase allowance on the 2024 XT5 and XT6. When news requires a bigger picture, a higher view, the Bomberito Automotive Group Skylands 5 is in the air over the scene. Local stories that matter to you and your community. The Bomberito Automotive Group Skylands 5, only on 5 on your side. Car accident? Let's talk about money. It's simple. The insurance company is going to pay you as little as possible. But what if that's not enough? As your lawyers, Kaufman Townsley will fight to get you more. On average, car accident victims with a lawyer get over three times more money than those without. You don't have to settle for less. Let us fight to get you the money you deserve. Real people, real results. Kaufman Townsley, 314 500 5000 SunTruck is the top-selling pre-owned dealer in South County because we have the strategies and banking connections to overcome almost all buying roadblocks. If you clear $350 a week, our SunTruck's auto acceptance program can get you financed. So shop SunTruck.com and choose from over 1,000 quality, worry-free pre-owned vehicles, most with a lifetime warranty. Then come on in and get approved. Save more. Save more at SunTruck. SunTruck.com. People ask me how I knew I wanted to be a part of the family furniture business. That's simple. It speaks to me. I earned my butterfly leaves in Ohio. I was built strong in Dublin, Georgia. Solid hickory. Save big on American-made furniture during the Miller Furniture and Mattress Grand Opening Celebration Sale going on now through November 30th. American-made, family-owned Miller Furniture. We're putting the family in furniture. St. Louis' share of marijuana money went up in smoke. All that green, about half a million dollars worth, City Hall dropped the ball and forgot to fill out the proper paperwork with the state of Missouri. So it doesn't matter that voters approve that extra 3% sales tax at the pot shop counter to bolster the city budget. That money is gone. The papers have been filed now, and that extra revenue will start to trickle in in the new year. And Missouri courts heard arguments from the NAACP and League of Women Voters challenging the state's voter ID law this week. Missouri started requiring a state or federal ID to vote again last November. If you didn't have one, you could still cast a provisional ballot, but would have to come back with a photo ID for that vote to count. One expert witness who surveyed that election data from 2018 up to 2022 testified that limitations like that might have impacted about 1 in 10 voters in some uh, key places. Voting rights groups argued the ID law artificially suppresses turnout and violates constitutional rights. It's not quite a home run. We'll call it a bunt single. The Cardinals took one small step toward putting legal sports betting on the Missouri ballot in 2024. Still a long way to go and a lot of signatures to gather before that question ultimately becomes a part of Decision 2024. We've all got a lot to be thankful for this time of year, but what's a president got to do with all that? We check the record next. Hardy's newest handcrafted recipe, candied bacon. Coated with caramelized brown sugar and a hint of pepper to add a whole new level of goodness to breakfast, lunch, dinner, or anytime. Hardy's, goodness in the making. Watch me. Watch me shine with every snap. Born to move fans, to cheer and clap. Two different legs, that's how I play. One built from science to help me on the deck. Between these lines, I'm all heart and muscle. Don't stare too long. You'll miss the hustle. Watch me. Pioneers in prosthetic technology at Schreiner's Children's. The most amazing care anywhere. Tis the season when money is tight. 
Tynamax gives you options to get the cash you need. I got $2,800 with my car title from Title Max. No title, no problem. Title Max also offers personal loans. I got $1,000 with a personal loan from TitleMax.com. Skip the holiday bustle, get money in as little as 30 minutes. Visit TitleMax.com today to get started, and you'll say, I got my title back with Title Max. Get your title back with Title Max. For adventure, for climbing, for splashing, for towing, for premium, for capable. The GMC AT4 lineup, premium and capable. That's professional grade from GMC. Step up to GMC with 1.9% APR on 2023 GMC Acadia models. Plus, no monthly payments until 2024. When it comes to good things, we always want more. Want more. Even as a child, Miss Moore was no different. More. She loved more. More? So when she was injured, she called Morgan and Morgan. With more lawyers, more offices, and more than $15 billion recovered, she didn't have to ask for more anymore. When you're injured, you deserve more. Morgan and Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. Hardy's Double Deals pack double the charbroiled beef and melty cheese. Choose a double cheeseburger or bacon double cheeseburger starting at $2.99. Hardee's, goodness in the making. Get exclusive offers on the Hardee's app. Before we go, we want to wish all of our viewers a happy Thanksgiving. And let's check the record. Some say the Thanksgiving tradition dates back more than 400 years to the pilgrims celebrating a successful harvest in a peaceful dinner with natives in America. But when you check the National Archives, you find the first record of the annual tradition in this presidential proclamation from George Washington. October 1789, the president said a joint committee of Congress had asked him to proclaim Thursday, November 26th, a public day of thanksgiving and prayer to show gratitude. Why? For the chance to peaceably establish a form of government for safety and happiness. Then again, in the middle of the Civil War, President Lincoln issued this proclamation, urging Americans to take some time on the last Thursday in November to fervently implore the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation. But every once in a while, November would have five Thursdays. So once again, under the shadow of war in December 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed a law freezing that fourth Thursday in November. Perhaps it's in those most difficult moments of struggle when we take account of all those things we value. We'll see you again next week. Until then, we're off the record.